What is up, Fitchtown? All right, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Uh, this is the death of Lazarus, uh, continuing on where we left off. Uh, this is a great chapter. Um, now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified, glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Wait, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So, so Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. I love that line. You know, because Thomas gets a bad rap in the Bible, doubting Thomas, right? But here he's like pretty courageous. Let us all go that we may die with him. You know, he's like, hey, the Lord's going, let's go. If we're going to go out, let's go out in style. You know, we're going out with the Lord. Anyways, all right, verse 27. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning the brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, and he was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Martha, saw Mary, excuse me, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would, have, would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. I believe that's the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35 of chapter 11. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe that if you believed you would see the glory? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on, of his own accord, but being a high priest that, that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who are scattered around, or gather into one the children of God who are scattered around. So from that day on, they made a plan to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let him, them know so that they might arrest him. Man, there's some good stuff in here. Hold on, I gotta grab some. Okay, I had to go get my uh, my King James. <laughs> so we're gonna go to we're gonna go back to the beginning. But in, in verse, this is where like um, sometimes the King James is difficult to read, you know. But sometimes it just hits it out of the park with this translation. I mean, the translation is good no matter what. But as far as understanding some of the words, verse thirty nine, <laughs> Jesus said. Take ye away the stone. Martha said, or, I'm sorry, let me start. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto the Lord, Lord, or saith unto him, I'm butchering this verse, Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> oh, I love it. By this time he stinketh. That's how I am sometimes when I get back from the gym. I stinketh. Anyways, I'll, <laughs> I, I just I find that translation funny. Um, so here's Lazarus dead. Now the Jews had a custom that where they believed there were, there was there was these kind of these like what do you call them where they're like uh, superstitions and things. One of them was that if you, that your soul there was these rumors like your soul hung around for three days. After three days, you're dead. So there's like dead, and then there's dead, dead, and that's after three days. So, so once you've been in the grave three days, you're dead, right? Totally dead. Um, obviously, you're dead, anyways. But it was kind of like a superstition. So when they, when he found out Lazarus was dead or was was sick, he knew that he was going to die, because um, he said in verse uh, in verse uh, or in chapter eleven. He said, "It is uh, the Ill this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified glorified through it." So he knew what was up. He knew what was going on. Um, but he stayed for two more days, which which put him in the grave for four days. By the time he gets there, so there's no doubt in anyone's mind. It's not like oh uh, maybe they put him in the grave and he was in a coma and then he woke up. You know. He's, he's not totally dead so he's dead dead that's that's kind of that's kind of part of it with why he um, didn't go there immediately because he wanted to make sure everyone knew that he was truly dead when he does arrive and then um, we get to that shortest verse ever uh, what is it? it's verse uh, 35 where Jesus weeps um, well actually before that so when when Mary or when Martha uh, comes out to Jesus it's amazing to see her faith like and this this is a great example of you know, she had an, ex an extreme amount of faith. She believed in Jesus completely. She knew that if he was there, Lazarus wouldn't have been dead, right? She knew that. But even we can have ex an extreme amount of faith, it doesn't mean we understand everything. And the part that she didn't understand was that Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. 
So she was like, yeah, I understand that, you know, he'll, you'll raise him up on the, on the end. I get it, you know, I believe in you, you know. But she didn't understand that he was about to raise her right this moment. Um, cause, and then he asked her at the end, he says, he says and uh, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. So she had a complete confession, like a fully accurate, complete confession of who Jesus was, the Son of God coming into the world, right? She understood that he was the Christ, but she didn't fully get it. She still didn't, there's still some things she didn't understand. And I think that's, you know, I think that should be some encouragement that this is a woman with an extreme amount of faith, loved the Lord, believed in him, but she still, there were still things that, that were right in front of her face that she still didn't get, you know? But in time, when we pursue the Lord, when we abide in him, he will reveal those things to us. And so you see that in the coming verses, that he reveals exactly what he's going to do and then does it right then. Um, and, and then when Mary comes to Jesus, she's just upset. She knew he was coming, but she stayed back. I think she was too upset to go see him. And then she goes to go see him, and, and she's just like, if you were here, if Lazarus would be alive, Jesus. Because she knew. She knew if Jesus was there, Lazarus would be alive. But she was just brokenhearted. And Jesus knows what he's about to do, right? So this chapter, um, chapter 11, I, I really think it shows the character and the heart of, of God, of who he is. That even though he knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, he's about to be the hero. Everyone's going to be clapping. Everyone's going to be cheering. Everyone's going to be crying tears of joy. Right? He knows this. He knows this is about to happen. But he sees her broken heart. He sees her sorrow. And it says he weeps. He wept. Jesus wept for her because this is the God that we serve. He's not a God that doesn't not, not relate. He doesn't not relate to us. He doesn't, he doesn't look at our sorrows and think, oh, just deal with it. You know, I got this all under control. What are you crying for? He, he's empathizes with us. He's sorrowful when we're, when we're sorrowful. Sorrow, sorrowful. Um, so just keep that in mind that, you know, that life is going to have its ups and downs, but there's going to be times of ex extreme tragedy and sorrow in our life. But our God, our creator, our maker, our savior, Jesus Christ, he, he loves us. He cares about us. He weeps for us. You know, that, that's a pretty incredible passage, especially given that he knew what he was about to do, but he was still just so brokenhearted over her sorrow. You know, I don't think he was weeping because Lazarus was in the was in the grave. He was about to raise him from the dead, you know, although I'm sure he was probably weeping for that, too, just for the fact that he's dead and everybody lost him. But he was weeping for them as well, for all for the whole situation. You know, he was just overcome with emotion and 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 it just shows this is God. I mean, he knows what's going to happen, but he's overcome with emotion, which is um, pretty incredible to think that, that that's, the, that's the God we serve. And, you know, people talk about, you, you hear different things about, well, if he's such a loving God, why, why this, why that, whatever. No, I just point you to this passage right in here. This is who, this is who our God is. Is he sovereign? Is he all-powerful? Is he the just? Is he the justifier and the just? Yeah, he's going to judge all those things. But, but he, he loves us, he cares for us, he weeps when we weep. Um, pretty incredible. And then you get to, um, you know, the, well, before we get to the, the plot to kill Jesus, the raising of Lazarus, right? So for me, when I look at this passage, it's the gospel in a nutshell, right? It, it's the gospel right there. You have a dead man, dead in the grave, right? And what happened? Jesus brought him to life and called him out of the grave. What did not happen? Lazarus didn't stand up as a zombie, walk to Jesus, zombie boy, and uh, and then Jesus psh, bring him to life, right? And I think there's people that there's there's two different camps. I get it, and I'm not looking to get into uh, any debates with anybody. This is just where I fall theologically as I read the scripture that regeneration is required, right? We have to be regenerated, but. We can't regenerate ourselves. A dead man can't raise himself to life, right? And in this this uh, passage right here, you see, you know, and it talks about over and over again that we're dead in our trespasses. We're dead in our sin. Apart from God, we can do nothing. And here's Lazarus dead, 
dead, dead, in the grave. Apart from Jesus, he can do nothing. But Jesus says, Lazarus, come out of the grave, right? So in order for that to have happened, what had to have happened? Jesus regen regenerated him, brought him to life, called his name, and had him walk out of the grave. And that is, that's the gospel right there, that, that Jesus regenerates our hearts, right? Gives us that faith and calls us to him. And then we walk. Because once you have faith, you're going to pursue the Lord. You say, so i got to wait for Jesus to call me? Well, Jesus will call you to faith, but faith comes from hearing. And hearing through the word of God. Romans 10, 17, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Hold on. Anytime I quote a scripture, you better double check myself because I'm prone to do fish math with scriptures too. 10, 17. Yes, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So, yeah, you know, Jesus has to call us to faith. God has to call us to faith. Um, it says apart, you know, we're dead in our trespasses and a dead man can't raise himself to life, right? Lazarus had no ability to stand up out of the grave, walk to Jesus and say, Jesus, regenerate me. I'm dead. Regenerate me. Can't do that. That's not how it works. So I love it. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's a beautiful picture of how salvation works, that, that he calls us um, to, uh, to faith. Um, and, and, and when we have that faith, we pursue him. We pursue Christ, you know. Um, I, I don't ever, you know, look to doubt other people's faith or salvation. I'm not here to judge anybody. If someone's a believer and they say they're a believer, they're a believer. But one of the signs of a believer, right, here's Lazarus, right? What did he do? He pursued Christ. Christ called him and he walked out of the grave towards him. So if you're not pursuing Christ, then you, you need to, you know, in every aspect of your life, you just need to, I'm not, I'm not telling you to question your salvation. But I, I am saying that not everyone who, who says, says in the Bible, says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So abide in the word. Spend time in the word. You should have a heart that desires to seek the Lord. And if, you, and if your heart is something that is desiring to seek, you know, politics, you know, money, wealth, jobs, you know, women, all these other things. And it's not that in and of itself those things are bad. Like if you're a single guy and you're looking for a wife, pursue that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're looking for a good job to make some money, that's great. You know, being aware of politics. I mean, I'm active in politics in the sense that I vote. And every political season I get a little active. I start paying attention to the news and stuff like that. But, um, but all of those things are meaningless in comparison to the Word of God, in comparison to Christ. And so... This, which I have to constantly remind myself, I have to live a life of daily repentance, and I have to wake up each and every day and realize I have to put Jesus Christ first. So when I wake up in the morning, uh, and some people like wake up and pray right, right away, that's not my routine. It's never been my routine. Um, I found that for me, I wake up, I brush my teeth, I clean, get cleaned up, I get changed, I get all my food together, and get on the road as quickly as possible. But as soon as I get in that car, I turn the radio off, and I start talking to the Lord. And I have a good drive into the office, about 40 minutes. So I can pray for 20, 30, 40 minutes if I want, just talking to the Lord, just speaking to him. And when you look about in, in this passage where it, um, it gets to once Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, I just think it's an amazing, it's an amazing prayer that Jesus had. It's, it's a conversation and it shows you how much that he abides in the Father, right? How connected Jesus is to the Father. It, 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 Jesus... Um, uh, he lifted his eyes, so so he, he looks up to the heavens, right? You know, and I imagine he's just looking right at God, right? And, and he sees him; he's con connected to him. He's looking right up to his father, and he says, "He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me." So he. <laughs> He's like having this personal conversation with God. There's all these people standing around that he's not like, hey, I'm talking to God about this. And, and, and he didn't say, um, uh, and, and I, I said this to God so that he would, uh, so that you guys would, would hear it. He's like ignoring the people. They're like, they're not, you know, there's no distractions here. He's completely focused on the Father. And, and he just says, I knew that you always hear me. He knew that. But I said this on account of the people standing around. So there's people standing around there, and he's talking to the Father. I said this on the count, Father, of all the people standing around. And they've got to be looking at Jesus and looking up in the sky and thinking, 
what is going on? And they're about to find out when he says, Lazarus, come out. And there's a lot of commentators that say that the reason, and this is total speculation, you know, uh, I'm sure that he could have said it without making this happen, but this is Jesus, right? This is God, our creator, right? He speaks everything into the existence. Everything is held together by him. So there's a lot of commentators that say he had to say Lazarus, come out. Because if he just would have look at the graves and say, come out, you've got about, you know, how many th thousand people walking out of the graves right at him. So I don't know if that's true or if that would have happened that way or if, if the sovereign nature of God that, you know, I don't know. But he called him specifically Lazarus. He didn't just say, come out of the grave, you know, and all these people stand up. And, Whoa, what happened? I've always wondered, the thing that I've always wondered about this passage is, was Lazarus sit, chilling in paradise? And he's like, oh, I made it. I'm in paradise and everything's great. And we're, and he's just like, this is so amazing. He's looking around, he's seeing angels and he's just, he's just like, this is just incredible. And all of a sudden, boom, he's back into his human body and he's got to die again. He's got to die a second time. Uh, yeah, there's only, uh, let's see, how many people, there's, a, there's only a few, because there's, there's a handful of people that got raised from the dead who died, who lived, died, lived, and die again. There's only a few of them in the Bible that talks about. But um, pretty incredible, pretty incredible. So uh, then Lazarus comes out, and we, we talked all about that. Um, it is interesting, he says, unbind him and let him go. So basically take, you know, they would be wrapped in grave clothes. And they're say, he's saying, take off your grave clothes. So, you know, when we come to the Lord, we come in all, with all this baggage and with all this past and with all of our dead sin and, and everything that's, that's in our life, you know, and we take that off and we put on the righteousness of Christ, right? We don't step back into our old dead, dead sinful nature. We, 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 we've been raised to life. We've been given a new heart. And, and so you, you put that off. And you never put it on again. You never go back into that, right? You walk confidently in, in the righteousness of Christ, knowing that every day the Lord looks down on you and he says, I'm well pleased. He looks at you and he's well pleased because you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when the Father looks at you, he's well pleased with who you are. So we take off those grave clothes and we never put them back. Don't walk around in your guilt and shame and condemnation. That's, that, those are lies from the devil saying, well, you're just a freaking drug addict. Or, uh, you know, you remember all, you know, you, you freaking you used to sleep around with all these people. You cheated on your spouse. You, you, Sasha, hold on. Sasha. But, you know, you, you lied to people. You know, think about all those people you lied. Think about the person that, that you, you, you hurt, you know. The, that time you lost your temper and, and you, just, you just lost your mind on your friend. He was your friend and you lost your mind on him. You know, that was your child and you just freaking lashed out at him. You know, all the, all the sin and shame that we have for all the things we've done, for all the things we've said, and those are our grave clothes, man. That's our grave clothes. And, and, and the devil wants, wants us to step back into those of, as our identity. And no, that's not. We, we put on the righteousness of Christ, just like the story of the prodigal son where the father clothes him in his robe. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So that's your identity um, when you're in Christ. Right, and then the, the last part here, I totally what happened though? Change pages. So then, the last part is the plot to kill Jesus. So part of this story, just kind of stepping away from some of the theology part, was, you know, Jesus was brought into this world to die for us. He was brought in to be the sacrifice. The sacrifice was required. All sin must be paid for. It's either paid for by Jesus or it's paid for by us in the future. But all sin is paid for. So he being both the just and the justifier, just in that sin, all sin is paid for, and the justifier in that he took our, our place. right? But that had to happen. And so part of this was the Pharisees needed to get really fired up. And when he started doing this, when he started raising Lazarus, from raising people from the dead in front of everybody, they're like, this is the Christ, right? And now the Pharisees are ticked. And and it's interesting is it's not like, you know, it shows their motives in here. That they're afraid that we're going to lose their power, right? It's talking about the Romans come and take away both our place and our nation. So he's, you know, th their heart is one that that's it's not focused on. Th they're not even their hearts are so hard they can't even see the coming Messiah because all they're thinking about is themselves and their power and their greed and their place in life 
and and they're you know they're supposed to be supposedly looking for the Messiah, right? He's coming. They prophes they they teach about him all the time. The the, the whole Old Testament's prof prophesying to the coming Messiah. They're supposed to be raising up the kids and, and talking about this, but they're not even interested in that. They're just like this dude. He you know, and they can't. They're so blind because of their sin and because of their hard hearts and because of their their focus on something worldly. Um, they don't have that eternal perspective that I talk about. And, and you see it right here. So he used them, really, uh, as part of his redemptive plan for mankind. That he knew that once he performed those miracles, that was going to get him fired up. Because their hearts were so hard. And so as soon as he did that, um, he, uh, yeah, he, um, he knew that that, 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 would, that would get the ball rolling. And it absolutely did. So, um, and then it talks about the end from there on out. Um, uh, you know, he knew that they were looking for him, so he kind of, you know, had to travel a little bit more in secret because they basically had like a bounty on him, right? Um, all right. Chapter 11, that was awesome. That went a little longer than uh, I planned, but um, there's just so much good stuff in there in every single part. So definitely was something to dive into, read. And, you know, I, I like to read the ESV, and I love this freaking killer Bible. This is a uh, Skyler incredible but this is my uh, King James study Bible um, this sucker is awesome so many good notes in here so many cross references King James is a great version I'm not a King James only person but I am NOT a King James hater at all I, it's, it's uh, nothing wrong with the King James um, and uh, and you'll 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 get some great context like <laughs> Lord he stinketh <laughs> so when, when you start uh, looking at one more than one translation uh, make sure you're looking at good translations I would have a primary, you know, my primary is the ESV, followed by the King James, and then after that I might look at some others, but um, anyways, alright, chapter 12 next.